Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to what will be the final webinar for History Reclaimed uh, in this academic year. And I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Marie Corta Daouda to uh, the audience this afternoon, uh, who will be speaking on the subject of iconoclasm. I'll give her full title uh, in a moment. Uh, Dr. Daouda uh, is an author and lecturer in French language and literature, teaching at Oriel College in the University of Oxford. Uh, she was born and raised in Morocco and educated in Paris at the Sorbonne. Uh, and she's also a fellow of the innovative online Ralston College based in Savannah, Georgia in the United States. Dr. Daouda's research focuses on the artistic representation of good and evil in periods of political and religious crisis. Uh, she's involved also in the public debates on freedom of speech, race, and artistic heritage. Uh, her, her book, uh, the book of her thesis, is entitled Lanti Salome, uh, Representations of Femininity uh, in the Period 1850 to 1910. She's a frequent contributor to Unheard, The Daily Telegraph, and The Critic on issues like post-colonialism uh, and uh, matters of identity and also French current affairs. So it's a very great pleasure to introduce to you uh, a, a very warm supporter of History Reclaimed. Uh, and Marie's um, subject this afternoon is entitled Iconoclasm, what the English and French revolutions can tell us about the control of art in public space. Marie. Well, thank you so much for having me, Lawrence. I'm very excited about this talk because, well, as you said, I somehow came into the public uh, scene because of these matters of iconoclasm and the questions that were raised about statues recently. So over the last years, we have seen a lot of this. I don't know if you can see my screen, so the toppling of Colston, the smashing of Cecil Rhodes bus in South Africa. Uh, and these actions have often been described as vandalism. However, the term iconoclasm is much more appropriate because this was not just some wanton act of destruction. There was, it was because of the meaning ascribed to these statues that they had to be removed or damaged. If we look back at the history of this word iconoclasm, um, the word has been used re retrospectively to describe the division that happened during the 8th and 9th century in Byzantium between those who were favorable to icons in worship and those who opposed them. But at that time, the word in use was much more iconomache, so the fight against icons, the struggle against images. This leads us to look at two forms of oppositions to images. There is a political one when images represent a previous reign or a past that we don't want to condone anymore, and a religious one linked to the inadequacy of figurative art to represent the transcendentals. When it comes to political iconoclasm, it has in a way, always been around. Uh, here on the screen, you can see a beheaded statue of Nero, a family portrait representing maybe Emperor Gita, so we don't know who it was actually, and a defaced coffin of Pharaoh Akhenaten. The last time I showed this picture during a uh, conference, there was an actual Egyptologist in the room who told me we're not even sure that this would be Akhenaten, it might have been Nefertiti. So this destruction of monuments does lead to oblivion. We end up forgetting who was who when the visual traces are removed. And this is a process that has been described rest retrospectively to as damnatio memoriae, although the phrase is in Latin and sounds rather ancient, it is a very modern concept. The first time it appears in a thesis is in 1689 in a German thesis describing precisely this process by which Roman emperors used to erase whatever traces of a previous reign could show that, well, things have not always been the same. Images are 
in a way inherently problematic when they are a representation because an image can become a symbol, a symbol, a symbolon referring to something that is not the image, but at the same time made present by the image. This is the reason why religious iconoclasm has been so deeply linked to Abrahamic religions, although, well, Plato and Pythagoras were already suspicious towards figurative art, the interdiction of any representation that would lead to worship is present in the Ten Commandments. It's the Second Commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thy thyself to serve them. The question that this raises is indeed, well, how can a man-made object represent the glory of God? And isn't any form of figurative art already complicated insofar as it is either inadequate or disrespectful because it would either try to imitate div divine creation or try to limit the power of God into a material object. We'll see that later with the Puritans. So there is this suspicion about figurative art being either useless or blasphemous. Nowadays, this attitude towards figurative art is mainly linked to Islam, but the recent case of cancellation in Hamline University, where a professor got sacked because a Muslim student complained because of a representation of Muhammad had been shown in class, shows that in, even in Islam, these attitudes towards art have varied a lot depending on space and time, and they still vary a lot depending on the religious school. On the Christian side, this idea is mainly linked to the Protestant Reformation. You see on the, on the screen the damaged relief of Utrecht Cathedral, desecrated in, six, uh, in 1566. So similarly, these ideas do vary if, even within the branches of the Reformed Christian churches. So images are can, can always be seen as a problem. And there is nothing new in a way about the post 2020 suspicion towards public art and monuments. However, what I would like to do today is to focus on two distinct periods that well are around the death, execu the execution of two monarchs, King Charles I of England and King Louis XVI of France. So respectively in 1649 and in 1793. Around the execution of these kings, we notice first events that have been qualified as revolutions, but also a surge on a, in iconoclasm. I won't look back at the iconoclasm that occurred during the Reformation of England through the 16th century. You know the story, Henry VIII wanting a divorce, separating himself from the Pope in Rome, dissolving the monasteries. Uh, the reign of Queen Elizabeth I did seem like a more peaceful time after a fair amount of hanging, drowning and quartering. Queen Elizabeth stated that she would not open windows into men's souls, which brought some kind of peace into the divisions about, well, who was enough of a Protestant or not. So to put things in a nutshell, by the time Charles I came to the throne, provided you were loyal to the crown and neither a Catholic nor an atheist, you could be any sort of Protestant you wanted. Unless things were a bit more complicated. And indeed, many were not happy with this arrangement and started wondering, well, did the Reformation go far enough? Are we thoroughly reformed or only half reformed? Queen Elizabeth herself was not averse to religious art and many Puritans like William Whittingham disapproved of, quote unquote, the relics of superstition present in the Queen's private chapel. Fast forward to the reign of Charles I. 
he was by no means popular. There had been many tensions around or during his reign that led to him dissolving the parliament and bringing the parliament back together again when he needed the parliament support to raise more taxes. So things were complicated and just as though things were not complicated enough, he also happened to have a Catholic wife, Henrietta Maria of France. So although King Charles I waged war against France to protect the, the Protestants in La Rochelle, many people think, thought that the king was not Protestant enough, especially because his friend, the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Lord, was very active in the beautification of the churches and brought back high altars, structured liturgy, and a structured form of shared worship through the Book of Common Prayer. I look back at two anecdotes that will render the spirit of the time, one linked to the Puritan William Prynne. So William Prynne published anonymously in 1632 a book called Historiomastics, where he criticised women going on stage and performing publicly doing this, well, thing that was ju judged absolutely inappropriate for women in that time. Uh, however, when this book was published, probably in the same week, Queen Henrietta Maria was performing on stage with the ladies of the court as it was customary to do in France. So, of course, William Prynne was ousted as the author of this book. He ended having the letters S and L branded on his cheeks and his ears chopped because he would have committed a grave offence towards their majesties. Another interesting anecdote of the time is when Janet Geddes threw a stool at the Dean of Edinburgh, James Henney, when he started using the Book of Common Prayer on the 23rd of July 1637. So these anecdotes show a bit of the spirit of the time and that the political tensions were also deeply intertwined with the religious tensions and the fear of a return to Catholicism. The external apparatus of the Catholic cult was linked to idolatry. So all the statues, the stained glass and all of that was nothing, nothing less than spiritual fornication by Puritan standards, because instead of worshipping the one true God internally in one's soul, people would be led to worshipping external forms and being drawn out, drawn away from the road of true worship into the worship of idols. According to Calvin, the human mind is a perpetual forge of idols. So on the in, in January 1641, the service in Canterbury Cathedral uh, using the Book of Common Prayer was interrupted by people shouting, this is idolatry and chanting psalms when prayers ought to have been said at the altar. There is one monument that seems to have catalyzed all the tensions around what idols are and what the public art should or should not display in terms of religious ornamentation. I'm speaking of Cheapside Cross. It was one of the many crosses that marked the path to, uh, of the funeral procession of Queen Eleanor of Castile, wife of Edward I, um, during the winter uh, 19, sorry, 1290-1291. So each of these crosses had ornaments that were linked to the Catholic faith, thinking of saints, uh, representations of the Blessed Virgin Mary, sometimes one or many figures of the Holy Trinity, and Cheapside Cross was particularly targeted through the reign of Queen Elizabeth at some point. Well, people said it should be pulled down just because it's too damaged and it represents a hazard in the middle of the street. Eventually, it was pulled down in 1643, but the response to this toppling of uh, Cheapside Cross was extremely moving. Many people wrote poems, uh, including this anonymous one, they say they'll pluck the Tower of Babel down. All things go right when there is no cross in town. But who can live without them crosses air? 
the good man's blessing and his certain share, he that would win an everlasting crown must elevate his cross, not throw it down. So the two final verses, elevate his cross, uh, not throw it down, would have been quite aggravating to Puritans for whom, well, the only thing that should be elevated is the soul towards God. But here we have this material object that had already been through many changes and had already had a, a, a link to idolatry because during the re reign of Queen Elizabeth, the statue of the Blessed Virgin with the, with the infant Jesus was removed and replaced with a statue of Diana, who, well, the, the um, virgin goddess who was um, frequently used as an analogy for Queen Elizabeth, but that was the best way to make everyone angry. So after a lot of struggle, this Cheapside Cross was removed. And the grieving for Cheapside Cross lasted until 1655 and even beyond, uh, Margaret Cavendish, the Duchess of Newcastle, wrote the poem An Ancient Cross lamenting the loss of the cross and saying that in fact the superstitious beliefs were not the ones that had erected this cross that had in a way always been there and whose only crime was age was to have been there before but the the real idolatry for her was to ascribe too much meaning to these signs that were in a way harmless elements and beautiful representations among the other architectural uh, treasures that have been lost well the chapel of queen henrietta maria was ransacked and all the pieces the works of art that were in there were burnt, as you can see in this engraving that we have on screen. And all of these were also, well, all of these actions were in reaction to what Archbishop Lord had done as Chancellor of the University of Oxford between 1630 and 1633. So he was linked to the Arminians without entering into theological distinctions Armenians were accused of not being too sound on the doctrine of predestination. They did believe that there was a way that your actions might influence your, the, your, the, the, uh, the afterlife for your soul. So Oxford uh, was considered one of these centers for Arminianism and the learned scholars often criticized for misleading the people because they would praise beauty and all that but not care enough for people's souls and one of the figures that has been emblematic of the uh, anti-Laudian anti-Arminian art was uh, William Dowsing whom you can see on the screen he became almost the archety archetypical uh, basher that was even used as a nickname for him. Uh, he would go around destroying, well, any innovations, quote unquote, in or about the worship of God. And all of this started uh, when he wrote to his protector, the Earl of Manchester, who was on the side of parliament so you see here again we have this problem of the union between the um, the religious and the political there so he wrote to the earl of manchester saying that well there is this ordinance passed in the house of commons in september 1641 but no one is doing anything about it and this ordinance is very clear that all the innovations brought in by Bishop Lord and his followers should be pulled down. So Dowsing decided to go on with this with the support of the Earl of Manchester who provided him with troops. Here you can see some of the traces of uh, monuments or, or engravings that have been destroyed under his command. But the most interesting part is what happened at Peterhouse in Cambridge. Peterhouse was considered one of the high places of Arminianism. Uh, statues of two large winged angels and four saints were brought down, stained glass was smashed, 
an image of St. Peter on the chapel door was removed, along with those of about a hundred cherubim and angels, while Bible passages illuminated in gold letters were erased. On the screen, you have the facade of the chapel at Peter House. We can presume that the two angels were there. I couldn't quite manage to retrieve where the statues were located, but indeed on the inside, we don't see any angels anymore. And that happened in the morning of the 21st of December, 1643. A few days later, on the 26th of December, 1643, in King's College, uh, well, Dowsing reported that he saw at least 1,000 superstitious pictures on the stained glass. And the best thing about iconoclasm is when it goes wrong. So Dowsing reported in his diary all the instructions that he had given and the things that had to be destroyed because it did not participate in the, well, the reformation that he wanted to extend through Cambridge. So order had been given to destroy these stained glass, these pieces of stained glass, but no one did anything about it. I don't know if it is because they just thought it was too beautiful to be destroyed or because the military forces lacked, but it is quite sure that Dowsing's endeavors to change the looks of all the chapels around were not met with as much support as we could expect. Similar things happened in the in Canterbury Cathedral. So in June 1644, Richard Kölmer and other iconoclasts uh, attacked the cathedral and went far beyond the removal of recent Lordian innovations. So Kilmer went beyond the ordinances of the House of Commons, removing things that predated Lord and therefore provoked a hostility of many people in town. On one occasion, there was a disturbance centered around the demolition of a window containing a picture of Jesus in the manger. And it is recorded that a woman started shouting out, save the child, save the child. And people were at this point wanting Culmer's dead. He was threatened to death by some of the people who were standing by the iron gates. A similar occasion happened when the parliamentary troops were leaving the University of Oxford. Here you have the Statue of the Virgin on the facade of University Church. Uh, this statue has been shot. I think the damage that we see is still the damage that had been inflicted in 1644 as the troops were exiting Oxford. Uh, the anecdote recalls that as the troops were shooting the statue, uh, people from the town came, rushed in and chased the military troops away because of what they saw them doing. Uh, the king was executed on the 30th of January 1649, and what is extremely interesting, and we'll look back at that uh, when it comes to the French Revolution, is that after the execution of the king, there was a sort of mellowing down in the iconoclastic purge. Uh, Dowsing's diary seems to fade away at that time. We know that the Earl of Manchester and Oliver Cromwell fell apart at that time, and he therefore he didn't get much of the support he expected, but maybe there would have been a lot of disenchantment and disillusionment about the whole endeavor if it had to culminate with the death of the king. I also recorded that the statue of Our Lady at Oriel College had been removed in 1650, but not destroyed and had been brought down. So I know we're uh, in a way the, the college with a statue, but the statue of Cecil Rhodes is not the first problematic statue we've had. And all of this is now fading into the blurs of history. The most important thing is that all this iconoclasm around the, French, uh, around the uh, English Civil War led to a paradoxical sacralization of the memory of King Charles. From being a highly uh, controversial king, he became king and martyr, and his death brought around him many people who initially were not quite partial 
for um, supporting him. And there is that pamphlet, well, the portraiture of his majesty in his solitude and sufferings. So the change in the uh, relationship to images has been quite a drastic one. one. And we moved from, from a king, king who did not have the support of uh, most of his parliament, etc., to a king whose memory can be turned into an icon with all these devotional images and with his own date in the Anglican church calendar. As Denis Diderot wrote, uh, my friend, if we love truth more than the icons, uh, more than images, let us pray God for some iconoclasts. It seems that there is a tension between ideas and images and that the only way to move from one set of ideas to another is to destroy the images that surrounded the old set of ideas. And that's precisely what we see with the French Revolution, where the overarching principle was egalité, equality for all, between all. And this, uh, well, a quick word on the French feudal system. There is the feudal pyramid where the peasants, the serfs and the bourgeoisie are protected by the nobility and the clergy prays for the nobility. It, it's supposed to work in this pyramidal way, but it is completely erroneous to see the third estate, so encompassing the bourgeoisie, the peasants, and anyone who did not have a title of nobility as being merely toiling in a drudge, a drudge condition in the name of exploitative first estate and second estate. The bourgeoisie through the 18th century in France had in fact acquired most of the financial power, especially after the independence of the United States of America put the French throne in a very difficult situation because, well, most of the what was going on in America benefited the king directly. So the bourgeoisie carried on making money after the independence of the United States. The trouble is that they had the money, but they didn't have any political power. Because in order to have political power, you needed to have une charge, a charge of state, which had to be purchased for dear money and which was usually hereditary. So the principle of equality was in fact a way of ensuring that the very rich bourgeoisie could level up into more power and especially gaining more political power. What happened on the 20th of June 1789 is that the members of the third estate asked everyone to reassemble in the Salle du Jeu de Paume in Versailles. Just checking that you still can hear me. Yes, still fine. Good. So uh, on the 20th of June, the third estate guarded in uh, the tennis court, uh, La Salle du Jeu de Paume in Versailles, and called on any members of goodwill of the clergy and the nobility to join them and that they would not go out until they would have a new charter through which more equality could be afforded to the bourgeoisie. So all of that was fair and nice, but just a few days ago, on the 14th of July, 1789, La Bastille was burning. So the Bastille was not so important in and of itself uh, by the time it burnt. I think there were only seven inmates in there, including Le Marquis de Sade, who was in prison because he was too much of a moderate when it came to revolutionary matters. But La Bastille was burned down because it was an emblem. It was an icon in and of itself of the king's absolute power because the king could just send anyone without judgment into the dungeon of La Bastille. And this without uh, without letters of warrant, without any announcement. So La Bastille was a symbol of the king's authority. Just a few days later, on the 4th of August, 1789, uh, 
crowds were running through Paris, sacking private hotels or hotels particulier and <laughs> churches. And a little later, in 1789, uh, the Église Saint-Barthélemy was demolished. All these demolitions meant to, were meant to destroy all the signs of the established power. And, uh, well, England kept its universities, but in Paris, we used to have the, univers uh, the University of Paris with its different colleges. In Paris, there were about 60 colleges, and they were all dismantled through the Loi Le Chapelier, a law that was passed in 1791 that prevented congregations from gathering. The main targets for destruction, however, were religious symbols, such as uh, the reliquary of Saint Genevieve, Saint pa patron saint of Paris, that was burnt on the 6th of November, 1793. It was burnt in a procession and the ashes were discarded in the Seine. So it was not just wanton destruction. The destruction was meant to mimic a religious procession, except that in the end, it was meant to burn down anything that represented the authority of the clergy. Other symbols of uh, authority were the, uh, the statues of the king. Here you have a view of the Place des Vosges, who was formerly known at the place, as the Place Royale, with an equestrian statue of, uh, I think it was Louis XIII. It so happens that most of the French villages, cities, towns had a statue of the king embodying, so to speak, the authority of the king where the king was not. So we think that the absolute monarchy meant that the king had jurisdiction over anything. In fact, there was a very precise hierarchy of who could decide of what in which specific place, which meant that for a peasant far away in Brittany or in Normandy, the authority of the king was not sensed, not perceived in any other way than through the fact that, well, now there is a statue of the king in your main square. So all these statues were pulled down and many were melted to construct cannons that were, I'm sure, uh, that were used to protect the revolutionaries. On the 10th of August, 1791, uh, King Louis XVI accepts the French constitution. And by, at this moment, he's not an absolute monarch anymore. He's a, a constitutional monarch, except for the fact that this constitution was never applied. The climate was so tense that no one really cared about the application of this constitution. What mattered was that the king abdicated his absolute authority. So the king was not an icon of monarchy anymore. And from that to his execution on the 21st of January, 1793, the, there is a very short distance once the king is not sacred, but just a horizontal embo uh, uh, applier of the uh, executive power rather than the embodiment of all the powers in one, it's very easy to find a good way to execute the king, except that the execution of the king was a ritual itself. So it was not just about putting the king out of, uh, uh, out of the field of action. It was about beheading him in such a way that everyone around could see it. The head of the king was lifted and the, his blood was scattered on everyone who was uh, attending the execution. So it was an extremely strong symbolic moment where, in a way, politics disappeared into a ritual sacrifice of monarchy in the name of an equalitarian republic. What is very interesting is that while the king was being beheaded, statues were not kept safe either. Here you have uh, uh, the gallery of the kings of Judah. This is the line of statues that you see on the facade of Notre Dame. All of these statues were beheaded as well. So there was a real fusion between the real body of the king, the symbolic authority of the monarchy as the head of state, and this lineage of the kings of Judah that was meant to embody the uh, absolute monarchy of divine right. 
the tombs in the Basilique de Saint-Denis were also desecrated. So between August 1793 and January 1794, the basilica was excavated and the tombs were ripped open, the bones were scattered into the Seine. So the, the present king, the past kings, the symbolic authority of the kings, all of this was merged in the same movement of destruction as though there was a necessity to destroy everything that ever had any link, to, link with the Catholic monarchy in France. This did create some tensions, however. Quite early on, the Comité du Salut Public had some very uh, contradictory opinions on art. On the one side, they claimed that we should destroy every form of art that would carry the corruption of the previous centuries. Uh, and at the same time, they recognized that there were some works of art of inherent artistic value that had to be preserved. Enters l'abbé Grégoire. L'abbé Grégoire was one of the abbots, one of the prelates who had signed the, uh, the constitution and who wanted a uh, constitutional monarchy, but who ended up veering towards the Republic with the civil constitution of the clergy. And he claimed to have invented the word vandalism. He wrote, I created the word to kill the deed. However, if you look at vandalism, it's a very interesting concept because it means that the destruction does not come from within, right? It comes from outside. And very interestingly, l'abbé Grégoire said that these destructions were too disrespectful of beauty and art to be actually French and that they must have been committed at the hands of English spies. So the, the, uh, the advantage of the word vandalism is that it casts out the responsibility. It doesn't see the conflicts and divisions as internal civil war kind of divisions, but as something coming from outside that has to be fought from within. One convenient way of dealing with problematic art is to put it in a museum. So le Musée du Louvre used to be the, pa the royal palace before Louis XIV migrated the court towards Versailles. Uh, the Musée du Louvre was used as a museum inaugurated starting from the 10th of, October, uh, of August 1793. The interesting fact is that although the museum had to remain closed for quite a while, then open again. Uh, anytime there was a change of regime in France, the museum changed names. So when the restoration happened and King Charles X of uh, France took the throne, throne, it was Le Musée Charles X. The revolution erased the previous symbols, but also replaced symbols by creating a new imagery. Instead of the fleur de lys, the lily flower uh, that was present on French monarchical monuments since the reign of Louis IX, they erected trees of liberty, Arbre de la Liberté. The national throne was replaced by the altar to the fatherland, l'Hôtel de la Patrie, and of course, the Virgin Mary as um, Queen of France was replaced with Marianne with her Phrygian bonnet. Not only did the revolution sacrifice all the elements that represented a monarchy, it ended up chopping off its own head. As you can see, well, in 1794, Georges Danton, Maximilien de Robespierre, Louis Antoine de saint just and all the, well, these capital figures of theoretical revolution were sacrificed uh, on, uh, in the name of a more practical, more hands-on understanding of the revolution, which only resulted in the reign of Napoleon, as though you could really not have equality without leaning in the end towards an even more authoritarian system. And the rest of 19th century in France was a bit of a chaos and I've counted that someone born in 1870 could by hearsay by talking to his or her grandparents hear, hear of nine different constitutions. So 
what can we draw from all of these instances of iconoclasm through the, the English civil war and through the French Revolution? Well, many people would often like to pretend that the past has never happened. But whenever this occurred, it seems that images come back in force with an even stronger meaning and with even more power over the imagination and over people's tastes and beliefs. So we can't really escape the fact that images would become icons. Images will end up meaning more than mere images. But what is striking is that the execution of uh, King Charles I and with the 14th marked a tipping point. Be it in England or in France, iconoclastic violence subsided after this, these deaths, as though regicide was iconoclastic enough to make any further iconoclasm rather bland and irrelevant. The thing is that these waves of destruction nowadays seem like interesting points of intellectual conversation or of historical inquiry, but it seems very hard to partake in the fire and the frenzy that led to all of this destruction. I hope this leads us to perhaps a bit, uh, a, a, an attitude that would be a bit more understanding towards the past, what, what had been cherished in the past, uh, just so that we don't run the risk of being seen as uh, probably fiery and overreactive as the, the French revolutionaries or the 17th century Puritans could seem to a 21st century audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Marie. I hope uh, you can hear me and everyone else uh, can hear me. Uh, that was an extraordinarily rich uh, and enjoyable uh, uh, tour d'horizon, really, of um, uh, 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 English 17th and French 18th century history. Uh, and I do thank you very much indeed for that. Um, before we, we talk about history, though, I just want to pick up that, that sort of last, last point that you made. Um, Obviously, iconoclasm in your talk is related to uh, massive political and social instability, uh, and it is in a sense understandable uh, when regimes are, are falling, when kings are losing their heads, when society is being uh, rebuilt, as it were, from the bottom up. Um, What's strange about, if you like, iconoclasm today is that, in fact, it's occurring in wealthy, stable, uh, in fact, rather, rather um, uh, um, uh, uh, conservative societies in some ways, um, and it's being perpetrated, if you like, by uh, minorities, there would appear to be majorities, very much against the kind of iconoclasm we have today. Opinion polls tell us that most people are not in favour of removing statues and changing names and all the rest of it. So I just wonder why, as it were, in periods which are no doubt changing, but nevertheless essentially politically stable in the West, uh, we've had this, this renewed bout of iconoclasm, which looks as if it's rather different from uh, the 17th and 18th century versions uh, that you've discussed. Well, I think what they do have in common is a certain fear of uh, contagion, as though the very presence of a controversial statue would make you or me guilty by association, and that's a very, uh, a, a very pervasive idea in in modern iconoclasm. And to that extent, um, although nowadays we do have more political stability than during the Civil War or than during the Reformation uh, or or during the French Revolution. What is uh, common is the, the shift of paradigm. We, well, the, the values have changed very quickly over the last 20 years. Very quickly, we have to deal with things that were, well, considered uh, minor minority issues and that are now center stage. And I suppose many people just don't know how to deal with that except by scapegoating 
public statues and monuments rather than tackling the actual issue. Uh, you're quite right that most of the time these problems of uh, spontaneous iconoclasm would occur in rather stable, wealthy places, uh, maybe because it is technically a first world problem if there are, when there are real issues to deal with, uh, people have a different sense of urgency and priority. And in a way, it, it's a bit, well, concerning that we would focus more on the inequalities of the past rather than just find some practical solutions mm. that would, in a way, not carry on repeating the same problems mm. that have been, well, allegedly ascribed to a past period. So mm. instead of just repeating that uh, people from the past were responsible for all of our evils, we could look at things in a more realistic way and try to tackle the problem mm. in a more frontal approach. Yes, indeed. I mean, I don't know if you would agree, but it certainly occurred to me as you were talking that um, uh, obviously when one thinks of uh, England in the 1640s and France in the 1790s, uh, 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 revolutionaries are addressing real questions of the moment about governance uh, and about uh, um, issues of equality and, and representation and so forth. Uh, and they're, they're thinking about the future and what should the future look like. Um, whereas you might say our iconoclasm is really trying to cleanse history. Um, admittedly, I mean, that would be rather crude. I mean, obviously, people who who take um, offence at certain statues, monuments, works of art and so forth, uh, have an, some sort of image in their heads of, of what the good society should look like. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get the sense, as it were, that the iconoclasm uh, of the 1640s and the 1790s was really focused on uh, English and French history so much as the uh, the present in England and France. And I wonder if if that's a distinction we should be uh, pursuing. Well, in a way, the, the dream of the blank slate is much more of a French Revolution mindset. There is a lot in the modern mindset that is directly borrowed from Rousseau, so just the the myth that if civilization did not exist, we'd be far better, or we'd be all very kind, noble savages. So there is something rather different between this mindset and that of the English Civil War, where, well, of course, there are different political and economical stakes. But for the Puritans, the idea was to return to a state of uncorrupt religion that, uh, well, is fantasized as well, but probably not as fantasized as the myth of the noble savage. They, they had a vision, they knew what things should look like, whether this would lead or not to the kind of holiness, godliness that they hoped for is, uh, well, it is a matter for debate, but they had a much more concrete expectation about what what the shared space should be. Well, it's interesting that you talk about Puritanism because from time to time in uh, our current culture wars, uh, people make the comparison between iconoclasts today and people who would, if you like, rip up uh, certain traditions and indeed the Puritan mindset of the early 17th century uh, with its desire, as it were, to cleanse, to go back to an earlier form of Christianity, uh, to uh, censor and remove all forms of uh, a, 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 a social uh, libertinism and so forth. Um, and I just wonder if in a sense, there's something to that comparison, given the 17th century Puritanism that you've discussed. I mean, is that a way of thinking about what we're living through today, a new kind of Puritanism, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily uh, uh, with a religious focus at all, a very secular uh, set of judgments are being made, but still a highly judgmental form of, of uh, social construct. Yes, well, the, Andrew Doyle's The New Puritans looks at this question of, well, to what extent what we see nowadays does echo 17th century Puritanism. I've mentioned the fear of cont uh, contagion, this idea that the wrong, the wrong person is, uh, is like a disease. It carries a sort of mental pest that has to be uh, 
chased away as uh, as early as, as as possible before the entire society gets corrupted. Another point, uh, well, like uh, as you were saying, there is the set of ideas that can be held, and then there are the unthinkable ideas. However, the well. I think that's much more of a constant than a uh, than an than an exception in mm. the history of thought. If you look, for instance, even at the the ideas of toleration in the 17th century, they were based on the possibility of excluding someone. So, the the toleration in the Elizabethan era is well, you can be anything as long as you're not a Catholic or an atheist, and toleration in France in 17th century was you can be anything as long as you're not a Calvinist or an atheist. <laughs> so there, there is a, a margin where things are acceptable. And if you trespass, that's very bad. So there is a lot of that in what is considered as modern Puritanism, but I'm not sure if this is exclusively Puritan. I, I think that's much more of the uh, um, gregarious aspect of uh, so, of social cohesion that always supposes that there would be some outcasts to create the in-group cohesion. The Puritans, however, as you said, achieved that by uh, having a very strong set of moral notions. You, you said it's very secular. Yes, it is secular, but uh, th there's something very religious to it, mm. that there are some mantras, there are some things that have to be said in a very specific way. So creeds and mantras and even the liturgical calendar that has to be followed. So it's, um, the, yes, I, I'd say there is a lot of the 17th, Puritan, uh, 17th century Puritanism in it, but with some nuances. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, you talked about dowsing and I'm speaking to you actually from deepest Suffolk, uh, not Oxford, in fact. Um, and dowsing is well known in these parts because this yes. was really where he did most of the destructive iconoclasm uh, that you've discussed. Uh, many churches in this area uh, have were defaced. And I've never met anyone uh, in my years in this part of the world uh, who has a good word, if you like, for what went on in the 1640s. Indeed, in a sense, the, the memory of the Reformation now and then of iconoclasm in the 1640s is, is a very critical memory uh, mm -hmm. because the beauty of holiness, to, to quote Lord, has been erased. And most people, in fact, I've never met anyone who has any other view than that how sad it is that these wonderful medieval images were destroyed and we are not able, we're not privy to them and we're not able to see them. And I just wonder, thinking of dowsing and what you've said, whether remorse, you think whether remorse is likely to, to follow our modern iconoclasm and that uh, within a period, I don't know whether a few years or a lengthy period, there will be a kind of societal response to what to what's going on at present. And people will say, well, actually, the erasing of the past, however offensive we might find or aspects of it, uh, was an error, was a mistake, um, because everything has to be conserved and we do ourselves our heritage damage uh, if, we, if we set about uh, whether modern iconoclasm or dowsing's iconoclasm. I, I just wonder if that's a, a fair reflection. I, I hope so. I, I hope there will be a sort of realization that uh, there are some works of art that are merely irreplaceable and that there are some statues that even though you wouldn't consider them the worthiest, the most beautiful, there are still statements about a certain era, about a certain mindset. Uh, mm. The interesting point when, well, when periods change and people's minds change is that it you, you never get a sort of public mea culpa mm. we're so sorry we put this down it's more of an obli oblivion and return and because well we don't have a, a grand inquisitor of statues like uh, dowsing uh, at the moment it's more of a crowd reaction it would be much easier to say, well, it wasn't it wasn't me. It would be easier to distanciate oneself from whatever has been done. So 
yes, perhaps perhaps it will happen. Uh, all all the activists must grow in age and wisdom, and uh, at some point, well, perhaps there there will be a realization that it's much more interesting to look at the real world and the current difficulties that some communities have rather than import a um, a, a way of reading the past that does not quite match what how people were looking at things some centuries ago and even our realization that there is such a thing as heritage is a rather recent one it's only well through the 19th century that we have developed for instance this idea of the museum it's it's only present in the west so it's uh, it it started here this idea that the the past is worthy of being preserved and it, it will grow people will learn that not everything should be discarded